ladies and gents, welcome to War Thunder with Mags, and welcome to my review of the N1K2J Shaden K, or Violet Lightning. The N1K is a rank 4 battle rating 5.7 fighter for the Japanese Imperial Navy, and it is one of the most dangerous fighters in Era 4. The N1K2 is a direct follow-on of the Mitsubishi Zero line, and as such, retains some of the Zero's maneuverability in its fighting style. It is, however, faster and more heavily armed, and historically it gave Allied forces a lot of problems when they first started encountering them. Now, it began its life originally as a float plane, which unfortunately we don't see in-game, but I'm sure will show up in a matter of time. It was later converted as a ground-based attack plane around the time that the American forces were encroaching on the Japanese home islands. This plane, as I said, gave the Americans a world of problems. It was fast, it was maneuverable, it could absorb considerably more damage than the Zeros could. It was more than a match for the Wildcats, which were the most commonly flown fighter for Japanese forces at the time, and was a very close match to the capabilities of the Corsair and the P-51 that were being flown as well on the encroachment to those home islands at that stage in the war. It was, however, produced too late in the war to really make a difference to what was going to happen. This is... Really, it's the Japanese version of the 262. Had it been introduced earlier, it could have made a mess of a lot of issue, a lot of things that the Americans were trying to do at the time, much like the 262 could have with the Germans, but it was just produced too late. Now, the N1K's top speed is around 660 kilometers an hour. It can go faster, however, if it doesn't use its considerable maneuverability during excessive speeds, otherwise it risks ripping its own wings off. At a turn time of 19.1 on rudder, this thing turns fast. In a full elevation turn, this thing will flip on its back in under three seconds. It is incredibly dangerous to turn fight. In fact, I don't think there's a single plane in the game in Era 4 that you would want to turn fight with a Shiden car with. It will kill you. Climb rate is exceptionally high as well. Now the stack card reads 2,217 feet per minute. Don't be fooled, the stack card is incorrect. This plane will climb with A6M5s, no problem at all. It'll outclimb just about anything in the American side and cl easily climb with, if not outclimb, most German fighters in the game. It will get above you nine times out of ten in battle. It is amazingly fast at getting itself into the air, which is something you have to watch when flying it because it cannot take excessive dive speeds. It will dive well, but pushing too much stress through the airframe will break it. Having that altitude sometimes isn't the best thing if you're planning on boom and zooming. The, the trick with the Shiden car is never dive more than two to 3,000 feet. Even if you have a 15,000 foot advantage, spiral down to the target before you jump on it. At altitude, try and engage the targets in turn flight at altitude. Most aircraft at, high, at the altitudes this thing is capable of getting at lose maneuverability where the Shiden car has absolutely no care of the fact that it might be at 15, 20,000 feet. It will maneuver just as well as if it was at 5,000 feet. And again, it will tear you apart. Now the armament on the N1K2 is pretty good. It gets four 20mm Type 99 Mark II cannons with 900 rounds of ammunition. They are Japanese cannons, however. They are low on the velocity. The damage is average. They are really good if you get them to close range, but you don't want to be doing snipe shots with this plane. To put it in perspective, the Type 99's Type Mark II's first become available on the A6M3, but they are effectively the same gun you first get access to on the Boat Zero. They're not great for long range shots. At close range, however, they are devastating guns. Now, the N1K2J is not the end of the Japanese Zero line. There is the N1K2JA that follows on for it, but it is effectively the same plane. The JA is slightly more maneuverable and slightly faster overall, but has exactly the same firepower package, exactly the same ranges, and is about the same in structural strength. So the final plane, for a very small amount, you do get an increase in battle rating. If you enjoy flying the M1Ks, this is the machine that you really want to take out. Now, enough talking about the plane. Let's go see how it performs in battle. So here we go, barely seconds into the match, 
or seconds off the runway and as you can see I'm already well past 2,000 feet and climbing fast so much for that 2,200 feet a minute climb rate. Now full rule battle guys the cockpit in the M1K is pretty good the bracings do get in the way a little bit when you're trying to look around but overall visibility is okay. Full WEP on the climb, the N1K does suffer from overheating problems, but they do take about 10 to 12 minutes of the match time in order to fully kick in, so you've got plenty of time to use that WEP hard to get yourself to altitude as quickly as possible. Now I'm teamed up here with Oz Salty, he's flying his A6M5. He got off the runway before me, so he's already peeling into altitude. We have another N1K. This is basically purely a Japanese fighter team. We have only one bomber on this team, no German premiums. It's all Japan versus America. Heading straight into the thickest cloud cover, trying to obscure my dot a little bit while trying to get to altitude. You don't want the enemy team to know how many fighters are climbing at any given time, if you can avoid it. So trying to use thicker cloud to obscure the dot is usually a pretty safe tactic. It doesn't always work. Sometimes players are very good and will spot you anyway, but every little bit helps. Now you see I'm keeping above the other A6M5s on my team that got off the runway after me. Now, an important thing to remember about the M1Ks is their dive performance is pretty good. Now, if you're looking at the aircraft closely, you'll see there are certain design aspects that are very close to another American aircraft, the P-47. Weight-wise, the M1K is actually very close as well. Fully loaded, it's just under 5 tonnes. Now, when you throw 5 tonnes hard at the ground, it will accelerate quickly, much like the P-47s do. Why it can't handle excessive speeds like the 47s can, this does give it an advantage in a short boom to be able to accelerate very rapidly on a target that doesn't expect it. Now as an M1K pilot you do have a few responsibilities to your team and your first and foremost responsibility is actually the elimination of enemy B-17s and they should be your primary target. That said, you should, even though B-17s have a tendency to fly particularly low, Taking altitude is a good thing, because the most dangerous aircraft you can face in the M1K is the P-51. If one of those gets above you, you'll have severe problems trying to catch it, and it can boom and zoom you continuously, and you will not be able to keep up with it. So first job off the runway is to check the skies at altitude for P-51s. If none are present, you then prepare yourself to maneuver in on B-17s. Now the reason why both the, the Zero and the M1K have the same problems with B-17s, they are relatively fragile aircraft, but the M1K can absorb more damage from the 50 calibers that the B-17s carry. They also have substantially more firepower, so they can take out the B-17s quickly, putting themselves at risk for a small period of time. It's your job to get rid of the B-17s before they win the match. The Zeros, uh, zeros engaging B-17s is always flip a coin whether or not the Zero is going to get a kill or whether or not it's going to turn into a torch. And as you can see, using that dive speed, pass through fast. The attack angle wasn't good, so I break away immediately. Do not attempt to follow. A couple of good hits will still light you on fire. Bring it back around for a second dive. Put that dive speed back in. Notice I never extend out more than a kilometre. I do not want to have to do a higher angle dive and put myself at risk of ripping. And it's always good when you see other M1K pilots who know their role in a battle as well. As you can see, second M1K and a Zero are both coming to engage this B-17. The Zero is ballsy, he is sitting right on that B-17's tail. Short burst, I run a shell straight through the rear gunner emplacement, goes straight up the fuselage and takes out the cockpit. As I said earlier on, long range sniping is not something you want to be doing in the N1K, but inside of 500 metres these guns are lethal. So immediately bring the plane back around, head back towards the islands. There is another B-17 over there, but it is being engaged. Unfortunately the pilot engaging it is being bothered by a premium Spitfire. Those things give problems, but I do enjoy fighting them, because, well, premium Spitfire pilots have a tendency to be very cocky. They assume that because their Spitfire can outmaneuver everything else, you know, why would outmaneuvering an M1K be any different? Well, the answer is quite simple, because it's an N1K. 
closing in at over just under a kilometre. He disappears into the clouds, follow through. I am following the dot around, trying to get angle for rollover. Invert and pull down. Flaps to combat. Sustaining about 8 to 9 Gs. Follow the rollover. Use the dive speed under wet to speed the plane up to throw it into the next manoeuvre. I'm keeping the wet on here because I want to make sure I'm constantly on his tail. Killing it could give him the potential of getting on my tail, but why maintaining speed? He just can't get behind me. Bring it around, beating me to the turn. Clip his plane. Now obviously did elevator damage because he has all sorts of issues in control here. Elevator or aileron. Spirals around, and that's the Mark II's at close range. 660 rounds of ammunition still available, and I've killed a B-17 and a premium Spitfire. Looking for new targets, and I'm yet to take damage. Still have plenty of fuel load on board. I tend to go out with around a 25 to 30 minute fuel load. Going back for altitude, the remaining B-17 was eliminated once the Spitfire was removed from its defence, and now it's just a matter of working out the remaining enemy fighters, which happen to be P-51s. Now these are the real worry plane for the M1K, simply because of the, the speed the plane is capable of maintaining. P-51s, N1Ks are real brawlers, they like to get in close, they like to turn, they like to duke it out. Where P-51s are Olympic sprinters. They hit and they run and they are a nightmare to catch. So the trick is you've got to try and goad them into at least a short turn fight because you only need a few seconds to take down a target. Now there are only three enemy aircraft left and two of them are P-51s. I never actually see the third one for the entire match. None of our team is yet to be shot down. These were some damn good pilots. Probably some of the best Japanese pilots I've encountered in a while. There is a tendency with the turning capabilities of Japanese aircraft for... Well, for Japanese pilots to get a little of the cocky side too, and it can get them killed. But these guys were smart and did everything correctly. Now, unfortunately, what tends to happen in this stage of matches is P-51s tend to extend the match out by running. And just running from wall to wall and using the respawns to keep ahead of the Japanese swarm. So the trip is you've got to try and manoeuvre all your fighters into position to box them in so they have to engage someone. The second they do they bleed energy and the team can kill them. So I've climbed straight back to 10,000 feet. Both the P-51s are below me. I do not want to try and engage P-51s while they have an energy advantage. I'm just following Salty around. There is a P-51 directly below us in the clouds. We have lost the dots, so we're not sure exactly where it is, but we know it's there. Oh, and there's the last player there. B-17 shows up. He's already being swarmed by an M1K and two zeros, so there's no reason for me to actually go down this time. With that many fighters and another M1K on the B-17, it's only a matter of time before it's eliminated from the match maintain altitude and continue watching for the P-51s. Now you see I've killed the WEP here, I'm trying to cool the engine down, the radial engine's at about 255 degrees, it's getting very close to overheat points and I want to save some of my engine power for engaging those P-51s because I am going to need the speed. Unfortunately it looks like the P-51s are hiding at the moment so with nothing else to shoot at and with two of the zeros having broken off, I will go down and have a tap on that B-17 after all. Just keeping it on a shallow dive, whip off. Now, the N1K's control surfaces do stiffen a little as she comes in. She loses maneuverability and speed, which is actually a good thing rather than a bad thing. If you were able to retain full maneuverability with no stiffing at that sort of speeds, you would break the N1K constantly. Loop over and bring it back around. Go to put a couple of shots in, but the B-17 
B-17 is going down. Unfortunately, that wasn't due to damage from any of our fighters. That was pilot suicide. The B-17 drove itself into the ground because it realised its survivability was... Well, it wasn't going to last much longer. Thankfully, somebody did rake the guns across the uh, B-17 before it went down, so a kill was awarded to the team, so... He didn't get away. And the two P-51s come in. So, immediately go back for altitude. As they dive down, dive with them, shallow angle. The trick is you want to try and get a P-51 directly below you, so you can use the weight and mass of the aircraft to accelerate yourself into gun range. As I said, you usually only buy yourself a few seconds, but a few seconds is all it takes. See, I'm already pushing into the warm zone. My warnings just come up on temperature, and the P-51 is just accelerating away. And this is the problem with engaging P-51s in the M1K. If they don't want to be caught, they won't be. But he brings it back around. We have a pilot down on the ground. He's attempting to go for a ground strafe, and he's coming below. Use that dive speed, and all of a sudden, despite being a faster aircraft, I am catching him in the dive. Get a strike. Nothing critical, unfortunately. Second burst, there's a critical hit. Now that damaged his elevators. He was able to manoeuvre out, but I did manage to save our guy on the ground. He took a hit, but he was repairable. And attempting the long-range snipe with the Type 99 Mark II. So as you can see, it's really not worth the ammunition you're expending. Some of those shells actually did hit the P-51, looking at the replay later on, but they lost so much velocity by the time they impacted that they did zero damage on hit. They simply bounced off. So, with my inability to catch the Mustang in speed, begin to take altitude, I've killed the WEP because I pushed it into overheat, trying to catch it to buy myself a window to execute this P-51. The P-51, however, will never gain altitude faster than the M1K can, so best bet at this point in time is to try and climb above him. This was the first sign that I realised that that critical had done elevator damage, because I actually missed what popped up on the screen. He is staying on the deck and not attempting to climb away, that's because his elevator damage is actually preventing him from performing sharp climbs. The second P-51 has taken similar damage at the moment and is being engaged by pretty much the entire enemy team led by Oz Salty and his A6M2. However, it appears that P-51 also took engine damage as the A6M2s are catching him. He's attempting to run through the, his allied fleet in order to provide some AA support, but uh, it doesn't seem to be working for him. The tactic, however, by the P-51 pilot is quite good. A single solid flak strike will take down an enemy fighter. As you can see there, one of our N1Ks just got eliminated by a incendiary round fired from one of the landing craft. He's just out of my view detection range at the moment, but he is still there and still up. And at this point, all I can do with my P-51 is track it. It has got critical damage. It's unlikely it's going to be able to perform a safe landing on the carriers, and it is no longer combat effective. The only thing the P-51 has remaining to it is its speed. And all he's going to be able to do is extend the match out for as long as he can. No more kills will be awarded to him, and no XP will be gained. Old Salty moves in for the kill. And there it is, he takes his P-51. So the rest of the team is now repositioning themselves to try and intercept this guy if he turns around and attempts to run and manages to get past me. He has managed to pull out 5Ks ahead and he's dragging me over the carrier swarm. I'm just being aware of my positioning. Doing small changes in altitude, just bobbing up and down, will usually throw off anti-aircraft fire at this altitude, although you will occasionally get clipped as you see just there. It is a risky manoeuvre coming to the carriers, but somebody is going to have to, because eventually he is just going to spiral around the carriers now for as long as he can. He needs to be taken out. 
Now from this point he just continues running south until he hits the return to battlefield marker on the southern, southern portion of the map. Realising if he uses a teleport he's simply going to be thrown directly underneath me, which is precisely where I want him. He turns 90 degrees and begins to run down the wall towards the next section of the map. The rest of my team is spread out to my right hand side in pursuit. There is no way for him to escape this. Eventually he's going to get boxed into a corner and we're going to fall on him. And it does puzzle me sometimes why P-51 pilots do this. He's obviously in a losing situation. He's not going to be able to land and repair. There's no way for him to escape death. He's not getting any ex more XP or credits. Sometimes I just don't understand the reasoning. Anyway, let's skip through to the end. Anyway, so about five minutes have passed. And he's made a turn. He's realised he's in a world of trouble. Straight into a 9G. Wep on. I am still running the engine quite warm. Realising that he had uh, no option for escape, he tries to suicide, but doesn't take into account that I critted him earlier on. So, almost ten minutes of flying, just for me to get the kill anyway. So, let's check out the results. So, I come in first place for the team with three kills. Oz Salty comes in second with two. And this was a hell of a team. The only pilot we lost for the entire match was one M1K we lost to the anti-aircraft fire from that landing craft. Final blow, 66,515 silver lines, 5,890 mod research points, and 2,945 aircraft research points on a premium account on a double. Not a bad match at all. So, the N1K, it's a hell of a machine, and of the two that are available in-game, I believe the first one is probably the better of the two to fly. You do get better matchmaking with it. You tend to stay away from the Bearcats, although I honestly feel that the Bearcats are less dangerous to the N1K than the P51s. Bearcat pilots have a tendency to try and get into a turn, and a turn is where the N1K lives. Hope you've enjoyed this video. Click like if you do. Subscribe if you want to see more. Fly smart, fly safe, I'll catch you in the skies.